Welcome in Aloha. I'm Mark Schwab, the host of Think Tech Hawaii's Law Across the Sea program. Today we're going across the sea of recent tragic events here in Hawaii to talk with Bradley Tam, the Chief Disciplinary Counsel of the Hawaii Supreme Court's Office of Disciplinary Counsel. The Office of Disciplinary Counsel, or ODC for short, oversees and responds to issues involving the ethical practice of law in the state of Hawaii. On August 14, 2023, the ODC published public service announcements warning the public about fraud and unlicensed attorneys in connection with the wildfires on Maui and the Big Island. I've asked Bradley to pro provide information on what the public should know about obtaining legal help and dealing with ethical issues that may arise during these tragic times. So Bradley, welcome. Aloha. It's good to see you. Thank, Thank you, Mark. It's an honor to be here. Thank you for being my uh, guest today and uh, helping us out. Now let's start right at the beginning of all of this with you, the little talk about the public service announcements. What are the risks that the ODC warns the public about in its public service announcements? Well, I think we got to start with the understanding that uh, the state requires a license to practice law to make sure that only qualified people practice law. I, I, most people know that lawyers have to go to law school. They have to pass a bar exam. That's how the state uh, tests to make sure that the individuals are qualified. But just because you're qualified doesn't mean that you're good. Uh, so that's why they have the ODC. We work for the Supreme Court uh, under supervision of the Disciplinary Board of the Hawaii Supreme Court. And what we do is we enforce the rules of professional conduct to hold these qualified practitioners to account for any failings in their uh, practice of law. Now, I, the reason why we're concerned that we have non-Hawaii lawyers trying to practice law is that I, we don't know if they're qualified. They may be, but they're not licensed here, so they're not part of our system. And if they're not admitted in the state of Hawaii, how are we, the ODC, going to hold these lawyers to account for any failings that they have in the representation of the individual? Also, you have uh, people in Hawaii that are hiring uh, unlicensed attorneys. Uh, what happens if that attorney messes up your case and you want to sue them for malpractice? Uh, if the attorney is practicing law in Florida, well, most times, if you sue somebody, you got to sue them where they live. So are you prepared to go to Florida to file a malpractice lawsuit? It's going to be really expensive. I, if they're admitted in Hawaii, however, they have to be sued here. They submit to the jurisdiction of, this, of the civil courts here. I, so that is one of the reasons why it's important not to deal with somebody who is licensed in Hawaii. And I could go on for a long time. There's all kinds of problems of dealing with unlicensed attorneys. And what was the motivation? I mean, the, how did the wildfires come into play here? What what uh, caused this? What caused the wildfires? No, what that, caused the, the public service announcements? Oh, well, I, once the fires wrecked the havoc that they did, I, I don't know, blood's in the water? <laughs> I... I I joked uh, a while back and I said, Maui's an island surrounded by water and the sharks aren't necessarily limited to the ocean. I turned out to be a little bit true. Uh, there's a lot of out-of-state lawyers that are flocking to line of trying to drum up business. Well, the practice of law is not a business, it's a profession and we have rules and we put out that public service announcement so that the people of this state will know that we're here to hold these non-Hawaii lawyers to account for what they're doing with our 
citizens, our residents, even our visitors to this island. And let's just quickly put up, uh, if we could, the uh, public service announcement. There is just uh, the first page of it. And where can it be found? It can be found on our website, dbhawaii.org. If you look at the uh, uh, front page when you get to the website, it's over on the right-hand side, right underneath latest update. You see uh, Maui wildfire press release. You can put on that. It's in three sections, by the way. There, there's three parts to it. The first one is a, a little blurb you can put on a, a Facebook post or something on social media, uh, something that 30-somethings understand is kind of beyond me uh, as an old man. Uh, the second part is uh, a, a longer but still short blurb, which was intended for use by the uh, print news media to put in news articles, and the longest part, which takes up the majority of the press release, is a detailed explanation of points produced by journalists who want to do a, a deep dive into the issue. Okay, well, just you, you talked a little bit about the value of having uh, a lawyer licensed in Hawaii because then he would he or she would be made to answer if they made a mistake. Is that what, what what should the public know about obtaining legal help? And if they come up with a ethical issue concerning the wildfire wildfire fires that they uh, incurred and suffered, uh, if if I could sell one point uh, to everybody in your audience is you shouldn't be dealing with an attorney who's not licensed and admitted in the state of Hawaii. I, some of these law firms from out of state probably have expertise, which is phenomenally good, and they know what they're doing. But if they're not licensed here, they're not legally allowed to practice here, they can affiliate with local Hawaii lawyers. So if you have an opportunity to speak with anyone who is offering legal services, the first question you ask them is, are you licensed in the state of Hawaii? And if they are, fine. If they're not, I uh, find out who it is they're working with who's licensed in Hawaii, and then deal with that person. Uh, that Hawaii lawyer can affiliate with this non-Hawaii lawyer and uh, pass information on to you, but your dealings should be with that Hawaii lawyer. I. Uh, and you can check to see if a Hawaii lawyer is authorized to practice uh, what we call active status by going to the Hawaii State Bar Association website, which is www.hsba.org. HSBA is the Hawaii State Bar Association. And on their front page, I scroll down a little bit, it has an attorney search function. You type in Mark Schlaub's name or you type in my name and you'll see that we're listed. You look at Mark, you, you look at your listing, and it says you are actively licensed to practice law. That means he's good. He's good to go. Okay. If you look at me, it doesn't say I'm active. It says I'm government. You can't hire me. I uh, So that's what you're looking for. You're looking to see if the person's name pops up on the HSBA website and if it shows active. Anything else, inactive, disbarred, suspended, government, judge, things like that. They're not lawyers that you should be talking to. Or not even there. If they're not there, yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. If they're not there, that's called a red flag. Yeah. You know, oh, check, check them out. Now, you, you mentioned advertising that uh, some lawyers, and, and I, I've noticed this. I mean, I got Facebook and emails from mainland lawyers uh, basically I think, I mean, soliciting uh, wildfire victims here in Hawaii or saying they can provide services. Now, is it, uh, I mean, can lawyers from outside the state advertise? What are, what are, the, what are the rules in Hawaii? Well, I, first of all, we've got a big role. Uh, if I can just momentarily digression into a little bit of history. Prior to 1978, it was against the law for attorneys to advertise at all. In fact, the only thing the law said was it was okay for an attorney to have a business card, to have his name on a letterhead, 
or on the building directory. But other than that, prohibited flat, nobody was allowed to advertise. That's why so many uh, attorneys became politicians. They didn't expect to get elected, but they'd run for office and say, I can write good laws for you because I'm a good lawyer. I know how to do it. That way they got to advertise, you know. Um, But in 1978, U.S. Supreme Court, in a case that came out of Arizona, uh, ruled that uh, freedom of speech applied to lawyers in a commercial context. And since then, we invented all these rules regarding advertising. Most of these rules were written in 1980 when the law first got changed. And so most of the rules we have are directed towards the kind of advertising you had in the 20th century, which was a long, long time ago. Um, uh, You had things called yellow pages, which some of my employees here don't even know what those are. Uh, you, you've got, uh, you had newspaper ads uh, where you would uh, take out an ad. I, I ran an ad for a while for myself when I was a bankruptcy attorney. I, and I, I, you had that kind of advertising. Well, that is legal for an attorney to do. An attorney can post an ad in a newspaper. Two requirements on a newspaper ad. One, it has to say advertising at the top. It has to say advertising at the bottom. And it has to have the name of the Hawaii lawyer who is responsible for the content. That kind of advertising is legal. Now, another thing that most people find surprising is you can't walk into the emergency room of a hospital and start handing out your business card. All right. That's called direct in-person solicitation. And that is against the law in this state. And I think in almost every state, it's against the law. Direct in-person solicitation is prohibited. Lawyers can write you a letter and mail it to you, uh, but if the injury involves personal injury, which is physical manifestation of harm or wrongful death, they have to wait at least 30 days before they can send you that letter. Okay? And again, I think that letter has to contain the word advertisement on it, at least in a mailed communication. See, any word advertisement has to appear on the outside of the envelope. All right. Those are the direct solicitation rules. Other rules allow, like I mentioned earlier, by uh, putting ads in the newspaper or posting them up on a website. Now we get to the 21st century. The law hasn't caught up with this. One does uh, these things, uh, it, it, new confangled mechanisms, Facebook, uh, LinkedIn, uh, um, uh, I don't know, ask a 30-something about them. Uh, when does that become a direct solicitation? I uh, needed a pair of shoes a couple of weeks ago, and uh, I went to Amazon to look up brown suede shoes. And I, um, I didn't find what I wanted and I forgot about it, watched some TV shows and went to bed. Next morning, I get up to read the news and I get my iPad and I open it up to MSN where it's got all these articles on it. And every third article has got an advertisement and they're all advertisements for brown suede shoes. How'd they get that? Are they spying on me? No, it's a targeted type of communications. I, and... The law is not caught up with this yet. Does this kind of targeted communications where they're mining big data or AI or whatever it is, does that take a general advertisement and turn it into an in-person solicitation? That's a real good question that hasn't been answered yet. Personally, I think it does. And if I find out about it, I may be opening an investigation on it. Because I, that's how law is made. They wait for the events to happen, and they interpret the existing laws. You know, and I, I've actually had that happen to me. I saw on Facebook a advertisement. It, it, it did have advertisement written at the top and bottom uh, from a mainland law firm, uh, and saying how you know they handle wildfire cases. And I clicked on it to read it. And then later I got an email from that law firm. Uh, And that email was more like a um, newsletter. 
if you will. And but it was the, the same type of thing, uh, basically telling how, you know what they're doing and how good they are. Uh, didn't I don't think it directly solicited me uh, or anyone, but it was you know I mean come on, that's what it was. Yes. Oh, okay. Uh, so I, I hear what you're saying is you know if you're a local Hawaii person, deal with local Hawaii lawyers, lo with lawyers that are licensed. Now let's say I am a honest out-of-state lawyer that wants to help. What should they? I mean, what is what should the out-of-state attorney do? If she really wants to represent, he or she really wants to, to represent clients in Hawaii, what's the ethical way for them to proceed? Um, that is being done by a number of high-powered mainland law firms. I, and a good number of calls that I've received have been from attorneys looking to find out what the process is. And the answer to that question is they need to affiliate with a Hawaii law firm or have a Hawaii licensed attorney on staff with the firm. Uh, then the negotiations, the contact with uh, residents uh, and property owners in Hawaii have to be made or need to be made through that Hawaii licensed attorney. Now, uh, there is a provision that once a court case has been filed, uh, the Non-Hawaii lawyers can file applications with the local court to get admitted for purposes of that case only. We call this pro hack vice administration uh, admission. Pro hack vice is Latin for meaning just this once. Okay, so the lawyer, the non-Hawaii lawyer, would file an application for admission pro hack vice. They have to have a local attorney sponsor them. And then that foreign lawyer, that non-Hawaii lawyer, becomes admitted in the state of Hawaii. Uh, they become admitted for all purposes. And that uh, non-Hawaii lawyer can then talk to people in Hawaii and can negotiate these things and, and deal in the case. But that only happens once a lawsuit is commenced. There is a, uh, another form of pro hack vice admission, which has not been implemented yet in Hawaii. It is pending before the Supreme Court. I don't know if they're going to uh, implement it as an emergency basis out of this or not. Uh, but uh, that is, is too early to talk about yet, but it's temporary admission for other purposes. And it's another pro hack vice thing. Uh, we are moving to catch up with what it went on in the mainland. There's a thing that they refer to in a lot of states called the Katrina rule that arose out of the 2005 hurricane in Katrina in Louisiana, uh, which allowed for temporary admission under the ABA model rules. And uh, uh, to my knowledge, only Texas and Hawaii don't have this in place yet, but we're working on it. Okay, so, you know, you the ODC is concerned uh, about the public and how they are represented, and to make sure that they're covered and that they're not going to be t taken advantage of and that they have proper legal help. Now, let me ask you, you know, we, we've all been devastated by what's been happening on the Big Island and on Maui, especially right now. How have lawyers been affected? How, how have you found lawyers to be affected, and what does the ODC do to help them? Uh, it's, a, it's a tough question. Uh, it's heartbreaking. Some of the lawyers that have been wiped out that were in, in Lahaina, one of the first things they did when I found out about this, uh, about the fires and, and taking out Lahaina, and I, uh, I think the last time I was there was in 2008. What a beautiful neighborhood that was. Uh, and I've taken depositions at a couple of those law firms, and that was the first thing that popped in my head. Oh, my God, what about, you know, so-and-so? And uh, so I had my uh, IT department do a run on any lawyer who had a Lahaina address. And we got their email addresses, and I sent out emails to everybody there and to the Maui County Bar Association uh, and uh, the West Hawaii Bar as well, because they had some problems over there. And, and I said, any of these lawyers that are affected uh, and, and have been injured or damaged in this thing, give us a call. Let's talk. 
and uh, I, 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 I received numerous calls from people who I uh, uh, suffered tragically. Now, if you're a lawyer who has uh, suffered injury in, in, in this, you lost your law firm or some of your practice, or if you know a lawyer who's been impacted like this, uh, they got two things there right off the top they can do. One is they can call my office and we'll do what we can, but mostly we'd like to put you in touch with the Attorneys and Judges Assistance Program, uh, which otherwise known as the AAP, uh, and to uh, get you hooked up with Mr. Liam Dealey, who's their uh, executive director. Uh, they are well-suited for helping people deal with the trauma uh, that has, has gone on. Uh, my office can help you with at least getting out in front of problems where uh, we need to contact your, your clients and tell them of, of your inability to be able to help them and to try and get things sorted out. Uh, we, we don't practice law. We can't get involved in taking over the stuff, but we can help run interference for, for you. And it's best to get out ahead of these things and, and don't just let them fester until they explode on you. So I, I guess uh, I've known some stores in Lahaina that lost everything. And I guess the, is the same thing happened with attorneys? Have they lost all their files? And yeah. I mean, is, is that what, have you, what have you heard in that regard? Uh, I had a heartbreaking story from this this one attorney in Lahaina who, who talked to me and, and she told me that when she found out the fire was coming, all she had time to do was grab her laptop and her client trust account folder and run for the hills. I uh, run out the door and, and, and get to safety. And she lost her house. She lost her practice. She lost everything. Fortunately, uh, a lot of her stuff is on her computer and it was on the cloud. Uh, God bless that. Uh, you know, uh, 10 years ago, Mark, everything we had was on paper, right? Uh, that would have been gone. And uh, she had the presence of mind to grab her client's stuff and get that to safety. And she left all of her personal stuff behind. Jesus, somebody ought to give her the Lahaina gold medal for this, you know, talking about uh, going above and beyond the call. I I think I would have been looking for pictures of my kids when they were, you know. Um, so, yeah. I. But uh, other lawyers weren't so fortunate. Some of them in our age group, you know, I... Paper is gone, and what are they going to do? Yeah, so I, I kind of I, I I I'm taking away a couple things by what you're talking about with the uh, AI, and that is that it, it it can hurt and it can help, and yeah. uh, and so there there's two different uh, uh, avenues to it. There's some good and there's some bad, perhaps in the same thing. In other words, uh, this one lawyer in Lahaina was able to save some important client information. And I, she called you for help at the ODC. Is that right? And and down gets the floor. Yeah, just to touch base and <clears throat> let me know her situation. And and we we keep notes uh, because you've always got the what we call <laughs> the my dog ate my homework excuse. You know, I uh, from from my high school days. Well, a lot of times you investigate lawyers and you write them a letter and they go, oh, all that stuff was lost in the flood. Uh, well, gee whiz, did you notify us when you had the flood? Uh, and we keep records. So I, these people call, they tell us what tragedy they've gone through, and, and we keep a contemporaneous record of it. So then if it later comes up, yeah, we can verify they were telling the truth. They let us know what had happened. Yeah. And can, can the ODC help with client, uh, client relations or just to help them get through it? Well, we can't represent anybody, but if a client is angry and they think that the attorney is lying to them and the attorney authorizes us to make disclosures because everything that goes on here is confidential, but that confidentiality can be waived by the attorney who's affected. So if the attorney authorizes to talk to them, I'll talk candidly with the client and, and let them know that, yeah, what that guy's telling you is that's what we observed, you know, and. It's not just you, it's other people that have been harmed. Uh, ODC is looked upon as the rat squad. You know, we're the ones that go out and, 
and hammer lawyers. You know, all lawyers quake and shake when they see one of two letters show up in the mail, either from the ODC or the IRS. So what's going to make your heart beat? But for the most part, we do a lot of peacekeeping here. Uh, and, and we try and get people together to talk things out because I'd much rather see a resolution to the, to the problem where people walk away feeling better about themselves and uh, I, I rather, you know, hammering anybody. That's, that's not what I do in old age. That was back from when I was younger. <laughs> uh, so I, 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 I hear you telling me that the ODC wants to help both the public and attorneys through this wildfire fire problems that have happened. Now, let me ask you, I mean, what, what have you learned about uh, life and the practice of law as a result of the wildfires uh, on Maui and the Big Island? Well, it's never a dull moment. And, uh, as my uh, old uh, proto- uh, uh, mentor used to say, why do you think they call it the practice of law? By the time you get done practicing, it's time to retire. Uh, yeah. But uh, this 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 has been uh, probably the worst tragedy that I have witnessed in uh, all the decades that I've been practicing law, and uh, uh, it's it's something that I don't think anybody was prepared for. I'll admit straight up, uh, I got an email from the executive director of HSBA when it first happened, and she says, uh, "Bradley, would you please share with me your uh, emergency response plan?" And I went, my what? <laughs> and boy, did I feel like a dumb dumb. And uh, immediately I went out to the National Organization of Bar Council, reaching out to Louisiana and uh, Katrina people and the people in Georgia and everything else that says, you guys got an emergency response plan you can share? Uh, yeah, I was, uh, and I think a lot of people were caught flat footed. How many of us are ready for these kind of things? You know, we're kind of almost ready for tsunamis and hurricanes, but to us, all this stuff can happen, and, and you never know what Mother Nature is going to throw at you again. Just uh, try and get along with people. Try and give people a little bit of slack, and uh, let's all try and remember we're human beings, and uh, we got to treat each other right. And so we got to help each other out, and it, and it appears that we are, and it's, it, you know, we, we, we just got to a little bit left in our program to close out. Is there anything you'd like to add to or like to say to the wild wildfire victims concerning yeah. law and the practice of law? I mean, I like what you've said. Those are good comments. Okay. Uh, the one thing I'd like to leave you with, and, and it goes to not only the victims of the wildfire, but for those who want to have something to do, uh, you're going to see a lot of uh, ads out there for donations soliciting for contributions to wildfire victims. Uh, be careful with this stuff. There's, uh, there's a lot of fraud going on out there. I seen one that uh, I looked a little suspicious, and I managed to trace it down to a lawyer on the East Coast who's soliciting contributions through an agency which is not registered through our uh, uh, AG's office. And I'm definitely going to try and find out where the money is going. But uh, if you want to donate... Uh, donate to legitimate organizations that you know that are well grounded. Uh, comes to mind the American Red Cross, okay, the uh, United Way, the Salvation Army. A lot of these things that are legitimate, registered, uh, uh, responsible, uh, beneficial organizations. If you hadn't heard of them, well, you know, uh, be suspicious. Thank you. All right. Well, yes, Bradley. Tim, uh, thank you very much for sharing your knowledge and your uh, comments and your help uh, with all of us. So aloha, take care. Bye-bye.